Okay, hi, I'm Peter Carty. I work for the National Trust. I'm a countryside parkland and gardens manager for South Shropshire and Kinver Edge. And my patch includes the Long Mind, Wenlock Edge, uh, Dudmaston, uh, and a few other smaller sites in South Shropshire. Today I'm going to talk about work on the Long Mind, and in particular the Stepping Stones project, which is a landscape scale project to restore nature. So fundamentally it's about wildlife and nature, and it's about nature recovery. We've lost a lot of wildlife uh, over the last decades and the last century, and probably all of us now are focusing on how we can put back wildlife habitats, how we can reconnect habitats, and how we can restore species. A little bit of the backstory of Long Min first. Um, the National Trust bought Long Mind in 1965 and in those days uh, we raised the princely sum of £8,500 to buy it and all of that money was raised by local subscription, people who wanted to save the Long Mind uh, for its views, for its wildlife, for its heather uh, and so on. Uh, well, what have we done, the National Trust, uh, in 50 years, which is the time that we've owned the Mind? And I suppose uh, it's worth just um, reminding ourselves that by owning the land, whether it's the National Trust or the Wildlife Trust or whoever, um, we can protect it. We can protect it from adverse developments, from unpleasant development and obtrusive development and so on. So the Long Min, 50 years on, is still a beautiful place, and that's important. The Long Min is a common, and we'll mention a bit more about that later. Um, so with the Long Min commoners, and in partnership with Natural England, uh, we have improved the conditions for wildlife. We've improved the wildlife habitat. Long Min is quite, um, quite a busy place, and a much loved place. And we have improved and maintained access routes for people to enjoy uh, the hill. Uh, we have a big education program, lots of school uh, children visit and students visit, and that is kind of self-financing. Um, it's not uh, too heavy a cost. With such a popular place, there's a number of problems and conflicts and we have been able to successfully manage some of those damaging activities like off-road driving, um, illegal activities are rare, um, there are still conflicts between users, but by and large we've worked to bring people together and reduce those conflicts. And through our work in the tea room and charging for car parks, um, we have largely, not entirely, but largely paid for this conservation work um, through our own income, making it um, pretty sustainable. But just going back to what we do, we look after a beautiful landscape and we do that in partnership with the Shropshire Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, we kind of own some of the key bits of land, but they particularly work with landowners um, across the AOMB uh, to look after the natural beauty. And we look after places for people to enjoy. Um, we don't buy them and lock them up. Uh, we want people to come and visit and be inspired and touched by nature. And looking to the future, uh, we're looking to create new landscapes for people, for wildlife, for food production, uh, natural beauty and environmental gain. Some things you might not know about the Long Mind, that there are 23 scheduled ancient monuments um, telling a human story of over 5,000 years. And our objectives are to keep these in good condition uh, and to highlight the story when we can. It's very famous for its geology. Um, this photo shares imprints in the rock. 
Um, these imprints were made when this rock was sediment on a seabed. Long Mind was initially laid down somewhere near where Antarctica is today and has travelled that distance um, over geological time. These imprints are now known to be imprints of bacterial blobs landing on an ancient seabed uh, and are the earliest signs of life on Earth in the fossil record. They were predicted by Charles Darwin to be present on the Long Mind and their recent, uh, relatively recent uh, discovery. They've been nicknamed Darwin's missing fossils. Well, to some of the nuts and bolts of the work, um, over the last 20, 25 years, we've managed to increase the red grouse population from 24 to 70 pairs. And this graph shows the recovery over time uh, as we have um, reintroduced burning uh, and control management and in partnership with the commoners uh, we've reduced the grazing. To manage access uh, we try to manage the paths to make them attractive to walk on and then manage the surrounding vegetation to make it unattractive to walk on. This helps to contain visitors uh, to rather lovely routes like this footpath. Very few people actually wade into deep heather, um, thus giving nesting birds uh, a chance to breed in a, in a relatively undisturbed way. The large numbers of people, plus the changing climate, have had their impact on footpaths. Um, we've had footpaths washed away, footpaths eroded by large numbers of visitors. Many of these footpaths are public rights of way, uh, and we've had a lot of support from Shropshire Council um, kind of repairing the backlog of repairs, which at one point um, was £190,000. Um, in the last 20 years, we've spent about a quarter of a million, um, three quarters of that by Shropshire Council, to keep these footpaths in usable condition. Now quite a lot of our work is working with local volunteers to do little bits of maintenance to stop them deteriorating again. So we've got this ambition to get the nation out of doors and closer to nature and reignite connection with the natural environment, with wildlife and beautiful places. So we provide entry level information to make the outdoors accessible. We get a lot of first time visitors to the countryside. Um, and that brings some problems and challenges uh, and we try to monitor the impacts of that recreation uh, and take appropriate remedial action. Lots of people want to run events on the Long Mind and we have a booking system which has an environmental impact assessment for each event. So we look at the timing of the event, is it bird nesting season? Is the event going to go near wet areas? In which case we say no, please don't. Um, uh, do that. Uh, we, we try to keep our neighbours informed as best as possible uh, and um, we spend quite a bit of time working with the event organisers to reduce the impact. I mentioned at the beginning that the Long Mind is a common. This means that local farmers have common rights to graze. Um, these come with their farm, these hill rights, um, but they're not paid for they are there by uh, ancient right going back to the Norman manorial courts. There are still 60 odd people registered as commoners, but only 24 uh, are in farming and put sheep on the hill. About 3,000 sheep are on the hill. And the commoners, particularly the young commoners now who are coming through, are very keen for the uh, visitors to understand the connection between farming and the landscape. The um, landscape you can see in that photo on the left has been shaped by thousands of years of grazing and burning and is maintained as an open landscape um, by uh, predominantly grazing with some burning and cutting by the National Trust. And were it not for this, um, the, land, the whole of Long Mind would be woodland. And you might argue, well, woodland's a good thing these days, uh, trapping carbon and so on. But of course, the Long Min is an important habitat for its open heathland, for its red grouse, for its meadow pipits, for its merlin, and all sorts of other specialist species. 
So whilst um, uh, we welcome you know, some trees uh, and they diversify the habit, habitat, um, we have to work very closely with the commoners who need the grazing and we have a shared vision which is being uh, evolved through a project called Our Common Cause. An illustration of the impact of sheep grazing is if you visit the reservoir in Newpool Hollow, which was fenced off in 1905, you'll see tall woodland um, filling that area. Uh, this is a snapshot of what the whole of the hill would look like um, were it not for grazing. And another illustration of this, uh, in 1995, the Trust put up some grazing exclosures in quite remote parts of the hill, uh, and these now, uh, as you can see, have rowan trees um, growing in them. Rowan particularly are colonising the hill fast. There are many hundreds of young trees uh, colonising on the western slopes where grazing is less. Um, is less. And this is a, uh, something that ourselves and the commoners uh, have discussed. The commoners are, are anxious about the trees causing loss of their grazing. Historically, uh, in the 80s and 90s, there was very high levels of grazing as the agricultural policy funded production. The more sheep you had, the more grazing, uh, the, the, the more grants you got. Uh, and this uh, policy um, was quite disastrous uh, in many areas of the upland, causing a lot of damage. However, um, we've now got a very positive partnership with the Longman Commoners and uh, Natural England grants, and along with our own research, uh, sheep numbers are much lower and more sustainable, allowing the habitat to recover, which it is doing uh, steadily and continuously. The agreement with the Commoners is a higher level scheme this is a government grant to support farming in uh, uh, allowing uh, nature to um, recover and flourish and habitats to, to be benefited. There's always a bit of a conflict between users and grazers. Um, farmers get very upset, quite rightly, about out of control dogs. Out of control dogs are a problem for ground nesting birds like curly and red grouse. Our curlew have declined from 16 pairs to two pairs in the last 20 years. And one of the reasons for that is disturbance from dogs. So what's happened over the last 20 years in terms of wildlife habitats? So the schemes, the higher level scheme and the earlier scheme, the environmentally sensitive area uh, scheme, uh, has paid farmers to reduce the sheep on the hills. And this has led to an increase in heathland there are now 120 hectares, so something like 250 acres uh, of heathland, uh, which has increased as a reduce of less grazing. Uh, the acid grassland, which is quite an important habitat, has declined by around 15%. Uh, it's been invaded by gorse um, and also heather, uh, has, um, has converted to heathland. Bracken, um, well, little change in terms of area, um, but in uh, what's actually happened is that there's less bracken on the heathery top um, because of spraying uh, with the uh, Agilux chemical, which controls it. But bracken has thickened up um, on the hillsides, and this is a problem for the commoners rounding up their sheep and also a problem for shading out um, important habitats and breeding bird habitats. Uh, gorse has had quite a dramatic uh, change. It's increased fourfold in 20 years. Um, and again, uh, it's a good habitat for breeding birds, but is quite a barrier to rounding up the sheep. And um, we, we manage it uh, to try and help that uh, grazing management. This is a sequence of um, slides which my colleagues in the Peak District have developed to show the kind of changes we're looking for on the Long Mind, from heavily grazed short vegetation to richer, um, more structurally diverse, uh, more ecologically diverse, um, better at holding water, better at trapping carbon, um, 
holding more species. And here's some photographs um, taken 20 years apart. Um, you can see the post in the foreground is exactly the same post with the same nails. Um, and you can see uh, that in the top photograph, which is an old control burn, uh, grassland predominated in the 90s. And now, uh, 20 years later, the heather has recovered and formed luxurious tall heather, which is great for nesting birds and has invaded um, across the grassland. And this is the picture that we saw in the early part uh, of this century, really good healthy um, heather recovering. Uh, sadly we've had some recent problems of heather beetle and drought and at the moment um, there are uh, about 40% of the heather area is looking dead. These pictures show the changing gorse uh, in the 1990s, grazing was heavy enough to hold the gorse to isolated uh, bushes, as we can see here above the Batch Valley. Roll on 20 years and the gorse has consolidated. Uh, here the gorse isn't a problem. Um, it, it causes a, a reduction in the grazing area, but it isn't a problem to rounding up the sheep uh, like it is in some of the valleys. And in this situation it's great to see linnets and ducks and uh, common birds like blackbirds uh, and stone chats uh, nesting. I mentioned bracken. Bracken is a huge problem in the uplands, um, has invaded uh, over the last few centuries huge areas of the uplands. Um, it shades out the grazing, reduces the grazing for the commoners. It shades out important plant habitats um, and it prevents the development of a whole range of invertebrate communities uh, for breeding birds. So all round it's problematic. Uh, we cut and manage bracken and over the years we've tried a number uh, of uh, projects turning it into compost, uh, turning it into fuel logs um, and um, uh, any, anything we, we can to uh, shift uh, the bracken. We cut about 60 hectares of bracken, 50 hectares of bracken. In places where it's really steep, we can't get the tractor uh, to. We've been using this radio-controlled robot, and in particular we've been cutting gathering strips to allow um, the sheep to be gathered from the top, where they're important in maintaining the habitat, to the home farm where they need to be sheared uh, and treated. Uh, and here you can see in the bottom right uh, Tom Lloyd's sheep being gathered by uh, his dogs um, walking nicely along a gathering strip. Uh, bracken isn't all bad. Uh, this is a picture of a winchat and uh, sadly winchats are declined, have declined seriously in Shropshire and I think now all of Shropshire's winchats bar perhaps one or two are found on the long mind. We used to have 120 pairs of winchat, now we're down to about 40 and they're the subject of um, a research project which should have started this year uh, but was prevented by Covid where we're going to look at where the nests are, the quality of the habitat, the quality of the feeding, the success of the broods. Uh, we'll ring the young birds and see which birds return from their wintering quarters in West Africa. Um, so we get an idea whether the cause of the decline um, is in the migration or wintering areas or whether it's to do with uh, thickening up bracken in the slopes, um, which has um, uh, had a kind of um, suspicious finger pointed at it as the possible cause of wind chat decline. There must be other reasons as well, because it's disappeared from lots of grassland um, throughout uh, Britain. It's a rapidly declining species at the moment, um, and we want to try and understand it so we can perhaps, um, perhaps manipulate the bracken habitat to improve its uh, success rate. Um, I suppose a bit of an oddity here, um, traffic damage along the roads to the edge of the heathland was getting very severe in the 1990s and early noughties. Um, by one means or another we've contained the traffic, uh, we've put piles of stone along the side of the road, um, small posts in and so on, and we've also stopped the county council uh, dumping tarmac like you can see in the photograph on the left, it had a bit of a surplus of tarmac left over, they'd kind of encroach 
and move onto the heathland. So the two photographs are in the same place and it shows the heathland can be brought back to the side of the road which keeps the road as a single track road, keeps vehicle speeds down and also creates that lovely natural feel um, which hopefully imbues visitors um, with a sense of that they're in a beautiful place and that they need to take care of it. Again, a photograph from the mid-1990s of multiple tracks along the top of the hill, um, people initially taking shortcuts or avoiding puddles, um, and a multiplicity of tracks. Um, this causes you know, more disturbance to wildlife and more erosion. And bit by bit, uh, we've contained those um, to a single track um, by putting a nice stone dressing down um, and trying to hide the other tracks with um, heather bales and, and such like. And largely we've been successful at that, so there's less area of the Mind um, with heavy public use now, or a reduced area. And this is the kind of damage that can happen uh, in very busy areas where um, conditions are wet in the winter. Uh, so by rerouting this track, um, it's recovering well, drying out, um, and um, uh, will disappear in time. So that's a little bit of a, a summary and a catch-up of um, work on the Long Mind. What became very clear to us, well, 20 years ago, and in conversations with the Shropshire Wildlife Trust, um, the managers of Stiper Stones National Nature Reserve, what was very clear was that just looking after a few nature reserves in the landscape wasn't enough to protect nature. Um, these nature reserves were too far apart. The landscape was becoming stretched. There was no connections in the landscape for species to move. And this is important because inevitably from time to time, um, a reserve or a, uh, an important nature site gets damaged by fire or disease and, and wipes out a species of butterfly. Um, that butterfly then needs to recolonize from a nearby site a few hundred yards away. And if that nearby, if the next nearest site is many miles away or dozens of miles away, that recolonization doesn't happen and nature declines. So for years now, we've been trying to find a way of working at a bigger scale than just looking after the hills. And for a few last few years, we've been working on this project called the Stepping Stones Project. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. Um, you might well have heard about it already, uh, but I'm now able to tell you what we've actually done, as opposed to what we uh, were hoping to do when I might have um, done this talk uh, last time. So just a reminder, here is a map of the Shropshire Hills AONB marked in brown. Uh, Church Stretton is uh, in the middle there, in that uh, brown blob. And the stepping stones there roughly is around the Long Mind and Stiper Stones with habitats to the west in Penally and uh, towards the Welsh border and habitats and landscapes to the east in the Shropshire Hills. Um, well, the problem is um, landscape change, um, decline in the quality and structural variety of landscapes. And we can all see this over time. If you look at the bottom two photographs, they're not exactly of the same place, but they're kind of illustrating the process. So in the bottom left photograph, you can see a rich landscape of woodlands and hedgerows, um, rough hill ground, meadows, pastures, uh, and there's probably some arable fields in there as well. So a diverse landscape supporting um, plant and animal species all year round. Um, that's the important thing. There needs to be habitat um, all year round, shelter in the winter or overwintering sites, uh, food throughout the year, uh, and, and so on. So we're very concerned about the loss of quality uh, in the landscape. And these are some of the species that are declining. Um, lapwing uh, are down to a very small number of pairs, less than 19 now. Um, on only a few farms within the Stepping Stones project. Uh, curlew, 24% loss in nine years. Uh, a bit more about that in a minute. 
Uh, wind chat, um, I mentioned to you, uh, now declined to the point that it's only really found on stiper stands, I think, uh, sorry, on long mind. I think there might be one pair on stiper stands. Uh, this club moss uh, disappeared in 1990. Lesser Tweble disappeared in 1920. Adder, well, should be a common animal around here, um, but no records in recent decades. And uh, pearl bordered fritillary now extinct, and ring goozle extinct in 2004, for a variety of reasons. But the big, big issue is this loss of connectivity that I've mentioned already. And here is a quote from the flora and vegetation of Shropshire uh, by Sarah Wilde and Alex Lockton, recently published, where the Botanical Society took stock of all the plants in Shropshire and compared this to an earlier atlas in the 1980s and were able to shed a light on the change in the distribution and populations of all of our native plants in Shropshire. And this was one of their conclusions, that there appears to be increasing polarisation between the conservation-rich and the conservation-poor areas in the Vice County, and an overall weakening of the ecological network. And this is a quote from a famous botanist called Charles Sinker, um, a nationally famous botanist who is based in Shropshire, uh, and he taught at the Field Studies Council at Montford Bridge. And he remembers the 1940s when it was possible to walk from the Long Mind through Rattling Hope to Shelve and Bromlow Callow over a succession of large, well grazed fields whose ancient turf was rich in flowers, heath bed straw, bitter vetch, bird's foot trefoil, uh, Good Friday grass, which we now call. Um, it's Lugula, isn't it? I can't, I can't remember its uh, English name. Uh, Tormental, Heath Milkwork, Jamanda Speedwell, Moonwort, and the beautiful Mountain Pansy were all common. And he wrote that in 1985. Now there's only about 16 places where um, the Mountain Pansy is still present, and many of those species uh, are in decline and very localised. Um, this map is taken from the Shropshire avifauna, recently published, um, led by Leo Smith and published by the Shropshire Ornithological Society. And it shows the difference in curlew uh, distribution between the two atlases. Members of the Shropshire Ornithological Society surveyed the whole of Shropshire in 1985 and again in 2015, 30 years apart. And uh, the red squares show where curlews were present in 1985 and again in 2015. But the black uh, downward pointing arrows show where curlews have disappeared in that time. There are some places where curlews have uh, appeared and those are the green upward pointing arrows. But the net picture overall is of decline from the lowlands and retreating to the uplands. You can see in the bottom left of the picture there's a lot of squares around Stiper Stones and the Long Mind and the Clun Forest and then Clearbury Mortimer, uh, uh, sorry, um, the, um, uh, uh, the hills at Clearbury Mortimer uh, and the Oswestry Uplands. So curlers have retreated out of the lowlands to the uplands. So you might think, oh, okay, you know, they're doing okay in the uplands. But if we take that group of squares around the Long Mind and Stiper Stones, we now know that that relates to about 150 pairs of curlew. Sorry, um, uh, 50 uh, to 60 pairs of curlew. Um, and various projects have looked in detail, um, and it's clear that those curlews are not producing any young. And um, they're on their way out. There are long-lived species not producing any young. And as the adults die, the population will decline and disappear. So this picture of species retreating, retreating to the uplands um, has happened with a few bird species. Um, and this is why um, the Stepping Stones project is so important, because this area is becoming a refuge um, in the modern, uh, very heavily used uh, landscape.
So it's very important to look after it if we're going to see nature recovery in future years over a wider area. This shows in a bit more detail the Stepping Stones project area. The two large green blobs, um, the, one, the larger one is the Long Mind. It's the site of special scientific interest and is a larger area than the National Trust uh, land ownership. And then above and to the left is the Stiper Stones National Nature Reserve. The other patches, the light green patches, are uh, wildlife sites which have been identified by the Shropshire Wildlife Trust. And there's actually quite a lot uh, in there, but some of them are so small they don't show up. And these are the areas that we think of as the stepping stones in the landscape, places where wildlife uh, can find a refuge uh, and breed uh, and move on to the next place. So the Stepping Stones project is about looking after these wildlife sites uh, and looking after the connectivity, the habitat connections between them and between the Long Mind and Stiper Stones. And this just shows that we're really trying to find uh, migration routes um, between these two important nature reserves and rather than them looking like straight lines um, in probability um, they're going to look like uh, all sorts of squiggly higgledy piggledy uh, areas um, with nice big stepping stones in between them this is a kind of ideal um, habitat um, uh, a kind of aspiration so, OK, looking forward, um, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, well, look after these beautiful places, um, which are still uh, prevalent in the landscape. Um, the top two photographs illustrate a conifer plantation that uh, was bought by the National Trust in 1995. Uh, the conifers were removed, and you can see in the photograph on the left, uh, lovely heathland has come back. But more than that, if you look down the slope, you can see we've got a nice transition from heathland into scattered trees, woodland, bracken, uh, and so on. And that area is called Handless. It's very rich in wildlife. You'll often see several kestrels uh, hunting there. Um, there's lots of small birds, lots of plants, and so on. And it's an example of what more of the mins could look like um, uh, if we could uh, manage it. The bottom two photographs show heavily grazed sheep pasture that's been improved decades after decades and a special bit of um, pasture which is found on the Stiper Stones National Nature Reserve which is one of those lovely ancient bits of pasture still full of yellow mountain pansy. Um, and what we're looking to do is increase more of that habitat. Uh, six years ago we were able to purchase three meadows um, to the north of the National Trust boundary um, at the top of uh, Castle Hill. Um, these had been in pasture for uh, a few decades. They hadn't had any fertilizers or pesticides on them, um, but they'd been heavily grazed. Um, and once we bought them, we opted to turn them back to hay meadows. And in year one, the grass grew and it was pretty boring. It was just grass. Uh, with very few flowers in it. But we cut the hay, um, which helps to reduce the nutrients, um, and we did a little bit of light grazing afterwards, and then repeated this year on year. Five years after the beginning, um, there was millions of flowers in there, all common species, um, and it was heaving with butterflies and bees um, and grasshoppers, um, and there will always be loads of swallows flying over it and dark green fertilities. So we'd achieved our aim, we'd achieved nature recovery. And here's another part of the same meadow uh, at just after we bought it, and then six years on, it's filled up with plants. And these are the sort of plants that were in there. A large amount of yellow rattle, which uh, I'm sure you will all have heard of, is a parasitic plant on grass. It weakens the grass, reduces its height and vigour, and allows space for other uh, plant species to move in. Um, so in detail, this is what the meadow looked like, with common cat's ear, oxeye daisy, uh, red clover, black knapweed. Uh, but look at the structure of those grasses. 
um, tall, erect, thin, um, with lots of space between them for small mammals and small birds to move through. Uh, modern grassland, particularly silage, is very densely packed, and particularly when it's wet, um, it's very hard for young birds to move through. Um, and there tends to be just one species present, so you don't get many interesting collections of insects and so on. So we were really pleased with this result. Um, some other key species um, that cropped up, um, common blue, uh, butterfly, again not a rare species, but you know, great to see it. And in the bottom left hand corner is pink waxcap, which is a red data book species. And um, when we visited there in uh, October of last year, we found 16 species of wax cap. Um, these are indicators of old, unimproved grassland, um, 20 species, and it automatically becomes a triple SI. And we saw 16 in a couple of hours, and almost certainly there were lots more underground. So a real positive indicator that we found a good bit of old grassland. Um, that by changing its management we were able to restore nature. And in the centre is a common spotted orchid, the first orchid to appear uh, last year uh, and we hope for more. We're moving green hay from Penalty Meadows National Nature Reserve this year and that hay has got the seeds of greater butterfly orchid and um, uh, fragrant or orchid uh, and we hope to see those species appearing in the meadow. And then on the right, common plant, tufted vetch. But on all of the tufted vetch flowers, there were six spot burnet moths. So all of these things were new. They were increasing because the seed was present in the ground and had found the right conditions to germinate, or the seed had somehow moved in um, from, from other meadows. Um, a rarity um, on Long Mind, and you can see its distribution map there, uh, this is Bilberry bumblebee, Bombus monticola, only found on long men, stiper stones, and a little bit of heathland in the Clun Forest, uh, which I think is a Shropshire Wildlife Trust Reserve at uh, Lower Short Ditch. Um, and that blob in the north probably is, um, uh, what's it, moss? Brown moss. Brown moss and those sites in the north. Um, but the bilberry bumblebee is using um, these meadows at Jin Lai. It really needs heathland and um, uh, nice flower-rich meadows. And it's the loss of these kind of marginal meadows that, that's worrying us, particularly on the long moon. So, what's our approach? Um, we really want sustainable solutions to address these problems of nature decline. We don't want a quick fix. We don't want a bit of grant money that does something for a few years. We want to really change for the long term um, the restoration of habitats and that these uh, new, newly created habitats become sustainable. We're guided by the principles of Lawton. Professor John Lawton produced a report in 2010 called Making Space for Nature, where he concluded that our nature reserves were not fit for purpose and they needed to be more of them, they needed to be bigger, they needed to be in better condition and they needed to be joined up. So we've been looking at where we can put wildlife corridors back, what the options are. Um, we don't claim to know the answers about how to put habitats back. We've got some ideas and we need to test and trial them. We need to do that through community and landowner participation um, and working in partnership. And the Stepping Stones project has been brilliant at bringing people together. Everyone can do a bit uh, for connectivity, ecological connectivity, um, and everyone, there's a, there's a lot of people at the moment want to help. Big, big thing for us is working with farmers. Um, Farmers probably have had a long history of enthusiastic people knocking on their door saying, wouldn't it be a good idea if? Well, this time around, um, we are trying to do it differently and ask farmers how they would put nature back if they had the chance. And if um, they put nature back, what are the 
what, what are the obstacles to putting nature back. And lots of farmers are very keen on nature. They love seeing the curlews and the wildlife and they want to do something, but they do have to make money. So we have been coming up um, with uh, new ways of planning uh, for the environment, farm environment plans, and we're testing and trialling this. We've got some money from DEFRA to test and trial this with farmers. And if the farmers like it, and if DEFRA thinks it'll work, it'll form part of the new environmental land management scheme, which hopefully is coming out in a few years time. And I think this is something that farmers want. They want uh, to do things in their way. Um, and we've had some very careful and constructive conversations with 15 farmers across the Stepping Stones area. The next element is community participation. And in South Shropshire, there's lots and lots of people who want to do things, plant trees, plant hedgerows, look after meadows. Um, and we've been able to bring people together. We've been able to put in bids for resources um, and bring sizable amounts of money to supporting these community groups. Whole Farm Plans was what I was talking about, the test and trial project. Um, uh, this um, has gone well and um, DEFRA have asked us to do more um, with more landowners. Uh, and before they introduce the Environmental Land Management Grant, they want to be sure that it's going to work and that it has farmer support. We managed to get a large bid into the People's Postcode Lottery um, and uh, Charlie Bell, the project officer, has mobilised hundreds of people uh, through community workshops, through volunteering, um, by supporting existing community groups like the Community Wildlife Group, like the Meadows Group, like the Verges Group, like the Dormouse Group, lots of small groups run by local activists uh, and fundamentally we're not trying to start anything new but trying to support existing and bring people together in an interconnected way to deliver an interconnected environment. And these are some of the groups um, that are active in the area and have signed up to be um, partners in the oh, oh sorry in the delivery of um, the Stepping Stones project. Um, so just uh, what we're looking at, uh, uh, sort of saying it again, really um, testing delivery, uh, whole farm plans. We're looking at acquisition strategy. Um, we have some money to buy some bits of land. We don't want to buy, um, we're not trying to buy everything, um, but we've been able to buy some bits of land. And one of the new community groups, which is called the Middle Marches Community Land Trust, has recently uh, raised money to buy uh, Norbury Hill, a portion of Norbury Hill, and some of the, the wetlands um, in the Stretton Valley. This is a local group run by local people with kind of local democracy um, and it's really mobilised public opinion to, um, I suppose, buy some stepping stones and put them in the landscape. Uh, we recently, um, thanks to a generous bequest, were able to buy some land at Fir Tree Farm, which you can see in the bottom left there, just below the gliding club on the western flanks of Long Mind. This is what it looks like at the moment. It's a section of the steep bank of Long Mind, uh, which is a site of special scientific interest. And it's three meadows uh, just off the foot of the bank, of which you can see one uh, in that picture. Uh, this is the view from the other direction. Uh, the meadows are separated by uh, Fir Tree Farm in the centre, uh, which is now an equestrian farm and um, we've bought these meadows uh, to the north and south of Fir Tree Farm. The meadows have been improved, um, agriculturally improved and fertilised, and there's just a few species of grasses in there with um, one or two plant species. But like the Jinlai meadows I showed pictures of earlier, we've uh, cut and collected these as hay, we've scattered yellow rattle seed, and over the next five years, we hope these meadows will develop 
a rich flora um, full of butterflies and bees um, and uh, we'll open uh, a small path uh, through them so people can carefully walk through the edge of them uh, and view them. So um, we've talked about meadows. Um, on the left is a nice meadow which is in a churchyard. It's Rattling Hope churchyard. It's a bit of ancient turf full of lovely plants like betony. And on the right is somebody's garden. Um, one of the best meadows I've ever seen um, and full of flowers. So the project hopes to connect these two kinds of places by working on the roadside verges. Um, and that's become quite a big project for us now, working with Shropshire Council to better manage the verges for wildflowers so they can become roads for wildlife. And similarly for woodlands, um, hedgerows are vital in the landscape for species like dormouse to move through from woodland to woodland. And even, even mobile species like bats need uh, to follow hedgerows um, and prefer to follow hedgerows when they can. So we're going to be looking at um, restoring hedgerows. Um, quite a lot of landowners have already expressed an interest uh, to have more hedgerows uh, and we'll be helping um, them plant them with volunteers using free trees from the Woodland Trust. Same with wetlands, um, about connecting uh, the good bits. So what are we doing? Well, I mentioned the community groups. There's a great group of people have formed a Shropshire Meadows group. I think they are about 90 strong and between them they manage 30 meadows. These meadows are all now being shifted to hay, like the Gin Lai Meadow. Um, the uh, group have been able to buy some uh, kit for managing them through the People's Postcode Lottery Grant I mentioned earlier and there's some money in the grant to pay contractors to cut and bale uh, and treat these as, as uh, hay meadows, which will restore the flowers. So we've got a 50-year vision. Um, this is some of the work on the verges um, that we've been trialling. We at the moment are managing 10 kilometres of verge in the area and actively managing one kilometre, sorry, two kilometres. Um, but we've just met with Shropshire Council and we're looking to upscale that uh, to many tens of kilometres uh, and they are keen to work with us and some of the grant money that we've got will help this trial uh, and demonstrate hopefully to the council and local people um, that by managing the verges in a more sympathetic way we'll have more flowers and more interest and, and a more beautiful landscape and a better connected landscape. And this is another quote from the past um, this is Charles Sinker writing in the Ecological Flora in 1985, the first flora of Shropshire, identifying that the lanes in Shropshire had sustained splendour from early spring to the end of autumn and that they're a price, priceless legacy uh, and we must not lightly let them go. Sadly, um, in a lot of cases, um, we let them go. Um, there are a few spectacular verges left these have been surveyed and identified and over the last couple of years the County Council has agreed to cut these late to allow the flowers uh, to set seed but we need to do more to restore them and reconnect them. So this is the view from the Long Mind across that new bit of land that we bought with Fir Tree Farm at the bottom to the Sniper Saves. This is the landscape, this beautiful landscape, still got lots of very good uh, uh, ingredients in it, nice hedgerows and so on um, and hopefully uh, even more in the future. So by thinking at a landscape scale and working um, outside of our boundaries which is relatively new for the National Trust but more importantly working in partnership with um, whoever wants to work with us, the Shropshire Wildlife Trust, our partners, uh, Natural England are partners, Butterfly Conservation uh, and so on. But most importantly, the most important partners um, are the farmers and the local community. Uh, and so far we um, are, uh, have got some very positive conversations about the future going and some very positive actions. 
uh, and there is um, Fir Tree Farm Field for us, um, the first stepping stone um, across to the Long Mint that we that we own. The Gin Lai Meadows here and volunteers uh, working uh, to spread flower rich green hay from Penelope Meadow. And this is the small pearl bordered fritillary butterfly. Um, and uh, it's a, a classic species that needs to be conserved at a landscape scale. You can't look after uh, small pearl bordered fritillary by looking after just one site. You have to look after uh, a network of sites. And anyone can do something for this project. Anyone can make a difference from literally a few plant pots uh, to a small verge to the edge of a school field. Um, we lost the key ingredients of the landscape by all sorts of little changes. And conversely, we need to put that landscape back by a series of little changes. Um, so there's the challenge. Everyone can do a bit. If you want to know more, have a look at the National Trust Stepping Stones project online. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook. And where's this project going? Well, wouldn't it be great if we could restore the landscape uh, or elements of the landscape from the 1930s and 1940s when black grass uh, was present here. Black grass is one of those species that needs woodland, it needs field margins, it needs wet bits, it needs farmland and it needs heathland. It needs um, a mosaic of uh, uh, habitats. Um, we're probably a long way from getting black grass back but it's nice to dream. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Um, I don't know if there's any means of asking questions but I'm sure if you uh, email the Wildlife Trust, they'll pass them on to me. Thank you very much.